have a wonderful webinar for us today. And then um, Deborah, who helps me put all these together, uh, wind this one up. Deborah, why don't you give us a little intro and then I'll come back in, in the, after that. Okay, well, we're really thrilled to have Nancy Borowick here today. Um, and uh, Nancy's a graduate of the, uh, uh, the school at the International Center of Photography. And she works constantly. She's worked for the New York Times and Oprah Magazine. Did Oprah give you a car? Like she gave a lot of other people cars? Uh, as no. Um, but also, diapers. No. <laughs> the Washington Post and she's won awards and uh, she's been a Sony artisan and uh, just a really impressive career. And, and one of the things that kickstarted her career is um, uh, doing personal projects. And, um, and so she's gonna be talking about the place they hold in, in, for all of us in our, uh, in our photography. So we're really thrilled to have her here. And this is really great. And I think it's a great topic too, because it shows that even if you're not getting assignments, you can self-assign and do work and still move forward. And, and then, um, so that's a really great lesson for any artist. That is, can I just say that is like such, I tell my students that all the time that, you know, like you can't necessarily wait around for someone to call you. Like no one's gonna hire you if you haven't shot an assignment. I mean, like it's a catch 22, like um, often with assignment work. So why not self-assign, you know? think of an interesting story and go out and shoot. Um, sometimes I even read newspaper articles and I'm like, or magazine articles. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if I could create an image that could also work for that magazine. Like I, that was an exercise we did in school. And um, that's how you build it. I mean, that's one way to build a portfolio. So. I mean, both the Anderson Cooper route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where he would fund himself to go to war zones and actually, actually do that himself. He wasn't being sent on assignment. He funded himself to go there. And uh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, I think that's a big part of the business is yeah, I want to thank being you. your own one woman show. Anyway, right? I want to thank you so much for joining us and also being part of the Sony family. It's a wonderful thing. And Sony came out with another camera today. Just saying, just saying another good camera. <laughs> I'm so happy. But uh, thank you so much. We're going to let you share screen and, and begin this. And everyone that's watching and uh, joining us, uh, you can use the Q&A panel and we'll talk uh, after the, the presentation. And uh, we'll hand it over to you here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, it's so nice to be here. I don't know what's happening downstairs, but um, my toddler has quieted down. <laughs> um, okay, so let me share my screen. So I'm gonna take, take you on a journey here tonight. So there I was, nine and a half months pregnant in a pink flowy dress, standing in front of a funeral director's conference in Midtown Manhattan. I was the literal embodiment of life talking to these undertakers about the gifts that cancer and death gave my family. Most moms to be at my stage are probably at home nesting. I was fighting for every last inch of my identity as I knew it before my life would completely change with the arrival of my baby boy 10 days later. Motherhood is the new lens through which I now see life and storytelling. And as with all things in life, as Robert Frost says, the best way out is always through. It's been said that having a child truly takes a village. And I think the same goes for photography. Community like this one will be there to support you and critique you and push you if you'll let it. In the end, you and your work will be better for it. Storytelling has always been a part of the fabric of who I am. I've always been a bit curious, maybe a bit nosy. And I have it on good authority that as a child, I was a bit of a tattletale. I prefer to think of it as an early storyteller. <laughs> so where do we find stories? What inspires you? I think we as humans simply respond at a primal level to things that we find pleasing. 
I have an ongoing project that explores the relationship between dogs and the people who breed, own, and show them. I spend days at a time embedding myself into their homes and lives, trying to understand their motivations and why they choose this life and this pack to be their family. And if I'm being completely honest, I just really want to roll around with puppies. <laughs> As a storyteller, it's important to make time to work on passion projects that truly feed the soul. Sometimes they require a lot of research and planning, and sometimes they just unfold right in front of us. The year was 1979. The place, Long Island, New York. <laughs> the hair was long, sorry, the hair was big. The sideburns were long. The sleeves puffy and the dance moves electric. It was Labor Day weekend and my parents were tying the knot. They met at St. John's Law School in Queens. My parents, uh, they were in the, the musical review who knew that law schools had such things. Uh, my mom sang, my dad danced and they continued this dance for 34 years. By early December, 2012, my mom was deep into chemotherapy treatment after a second recurrence with metastatic breast cancer when my dad got his diagnosis, stage four pancreatic cancer. There they were in treatment together, side by side. And this was our new normal. I couldn't heal my parents, so I did what I knew how to do. I photographed them. I wanted to spend more time with them, not knowing how much time we really had left. It also helped that they were used to me having my camera with me always. <laughs> and I think they understood why I needed to shoot. And what I realized pretty quickly, however, was that the story I was documenting and the story we were experiencing wasn't about cancer or dying. It was about living. I believe that when you're faced with your own mortality, you really begin to appreciate what it means to be alive. No one wants to talk about death, but we had to, they wanted to. And we found that talking was one of the greatest gifts that cancer gave us. Cancer didn't define my parents and they certainly didn't wanna be pitied. My mom was this selfless, generous, beautiful soul. And my dad was passionate and boisterous and larger than life. Having lived outside of our home since high school graduation, it was a bit of a novelty to have me around. It was really difficult to be that quiet fly on the wall, but they got used to me and eventually forgot I was there. Like during this moment when they waited to hear about scan results. What if one had good news and one had bad news? And why were they taking this very important phone call in the bathroom? We did our best to follow doctor's orders. Dad lost nearly 40 pounds overnight and it was imperative that he take in as many calories as he could stomach. So we did as the doctor ordered and our meals became a lot of takeout, ice cream, smoothies, pizza for more meals than I can count. And to no one's surprise, he gained weight. We all gained weight. <laughs> there was a lot of joy, a lot of love, and a lot of dancing. And I decided to show this personal journal of photographs to a mentor of mine because I was worried that I was too close to the story and that maybe I would miss something and ultimately she insisted that I share the project, 
believing that my story would touch people and maybe help others going through something similar. But it was hard to see my story as anything of value to other people. You know, it was just my family and my life, but I decided, okay, maybe I'll just submit it to a contest. I didn't win the contest, but I won something much more valuable. An email from James Estrin from the New York Times, who was one of the judges um, on the panel. And he said that he wanted to publish my story. I remember calling my parents that day and saying, so the New York Times wants to publish our story. What do you think? <laughs> they were like, well, that's weird. Why would anyone care? Um, you know, it wasn't a unique story necessarily, uh, but insisted that if it was important to me and my career, then absolutely they were on board. I also remember them saying, you know, what do we have to lose? So the story for the paper needed a climax. And luckily we had the perfect event to fit the bill. A wedding, mine. <laughs> My husband and I had gotten engaged a few months prior and decided to expedite the wedding for the sake of my parents. We picked a date, October 5th, 2013. It gave my family something to look forward to and I think it served as a bit of a distraction. When the day came, they walked me down the aisle, arm in arm, on that warm fall afternoon in the apple orchard. Oh, and you may be asking yourself, how could I have possibly photographed this moment in my own wedding? Well, once wearing a GoPro was ruled out as an appropriate option, we found a better alternative. I climbed a tree the morning of the wedding and rigged up a camera between the branches. The plan was for me to walk down the aisle and trigger a remote, a pocket wizard from my bouquet. I thought it was genius. Um, ultimately though, I decided that I would let go of control just for this moment and be entirely present. So I handed the remote off to a friend. Two weeks later, my life changed forever. This story was published in the New York Times and my inbox was flooded. It is amazing how alone you can feel when you are dealing with terminal illness, even as the caretaker. And here we were, the least alone we had ever felt. I grieved with every letter, but I also felt a deep connection and understanding with each and every one. One woman wrote to me and told me that my images scared her because she was about to go through the same thing with her mother. So she wanted to thank me for being so open because it helped her feel more prepared for what was to come. It was our story, but it was everyone's narrative. The very same weekend the story ran, my father was admitted to the hospital. He was jaundiced and in a lot of pain. It had become clear that his quality of life had sharply diminished and he decided he had had enough. A do not resuscitate bracelet was attached to his wrist. The order was signed. And he lay there with a certain, a certain peacefulness about him. Remove all the wires and the machines. He could be at the beach without a care in the world. We wanted him to fight, but that's what we wanted. This was his life and his decision to make. And we had to respect and honor it. And he had time to think about this decision too. His parents both died of cancer when he was just a child. So he never expected to live as long as he did and was grateful for the time that he did have. The camera played a very important role for me 
during this time, more important than I may have realized. One day I put the camera down while my father was having an IV put into his arm. And the next thing I know, I am being laid onto a bed and uh, in, in the room next door. Um, proof of this exists actually because my mother came giggling around the corner and made this image with my camera while uttering how the tables have turned. My camera was my armor and without it, I was left vulnerable and I must have fainted. Dad died on December 7th, 2013. It was the 40th anniversary of his mother's death and exactly a year and a day since diagnosis. He would have loved his funeral. There he was, center of attention, surrounded by all of the people he adored in the world. When I asked him if he was curious what people might say about him at his funeral, he told me, I don't wonder, I wrote it. And then he handed me his eulogy. It was 14 pages long. I've been asked why my images are in black and white. And I think it's important that when you make an artistic decision like this, you can explain why. This story was always in black and white. And I didn't see or feel color during this time. And without color, these images are timeless. This came full circle for me when I was asked to submit my raw files to the World Press Photo Competition. I froze in my tracks when I came upon this image. I burst into uncontrollable tears. It's hard for me to even look at it now. The last time I saw this image in color was the moment I lived it. Life is in color. And by having these images in black and white, I was able to have some distance from reality and that helped me. But life moves on. Uh, so the project continued. My mother was the opposite of my father and, <clears throat> and hated to be the center of attention. I think she found purpose in the distraction from her disease that caring for my dad gave her. Her whole being wasn't consumed by illness. To her doctors, her surgeons, her health insurance company, she was just a patient, but to us, she was mom. And to him, she was Laurel. Having been sick on and off for 18 years, cancer was just an item, another item on her to-do list. She was the queen of to-do lists and I definitely get that from her. And I loved her list. To me, they screamed life, order how we headstone, decide regarding radiation, one exclamation point, join the gym and start going, four exclamation points. And my all-time favorite, what happened to the Girl Scout cookies? All of equal importance. There's really only so much a person can take. And by the following fall, my mom's health started to take a turn for the worst. One night while lying in her bed beside her, she turned to me and asked if I could start looking into home hospice care. I said, of course, as I, you know, slowly turned my head to the other side of the pillow so she wouldn't see me starting to cry. Somehow I couldn't believe we were at this point. She had been sick for so much of my life. I thought she would be sick forever, but still be here with us. I know that is so unfair to even think about. 
I began to obsessively record everything during this time in images and videos in phone recordings of conversations I don't even remember us having. I needed to hold on to her for as long as I could, as much as I could. It was hard to find levity in these final days of my mom's life, but lucky for us, we had Moses, a friend's dog, who would sit on top of my mother's chest and snort loudly with every breath. My mom watched my dad die in the hospital with machines beeping, fluorescent lights blaring, and a slew of doctors and nurses who were practically strangers. She didn't want that. She wanted to be at home in her PJs, listening to James Taylor and surrounded by her family. So that's what we did. And as we watched her chest rise and fall, we all sort of locked eyes in a, you okay? You okay? And then she stopped breathing. December 6th, 2014. 364 days after my father passed away, we were back in the temple. Only this time, this seat next to my brother was empty. Not long after she died, my siblings and I decided to start the daunting task of packing up our family home. And to my surprise, it was actually a really beautiful experience. We uncovered beautiful cards our parents wrote to each other over the years, shoe boxes full of four by sixes, even teeth collected by the tooth fairy. What do you keep? What really matters in the end? This was a challenge for me as I am a bit of a collector, but I think back to something my mother shared with me before she died. She said, the people you love, they live on inside of you because they are already a part of the person that you are. I am my mother's daughter and I get to keep that forever. In Jewish tradition, you return to the cemetery a year after a death to honor the person you lost. We call it an unveiling. Because of the timing of my father's, or because of the timing of my mother's death, we decided to hold off on my father's unveiling and honor them together, side by side, when we were ready. Life determined the end of the photographic part of this project, but I wasn't done telling the story. So I set about the task of rounding out my images with actual bits and pieces of their time together and their lives before one another. I discovered diary entries, cards, old family photos, and the odds and ends of everyday life. It was highly therapeutic for me since it enabled me to celebrate their lives and not just properly mark their deaths. I wanted to memorialize my parents' story in some way, give it, you know, to give it the gravitas and the lasting legacy that I felt it deserved and to share it with the world. Because I figured that if diving into the full lives of my parents while I documented their deaths helped me process my grief, it might just help someone else. So I set about the, I set about creating a scrapbook that could contain all of the wonder and the joy and the love they shared to the very end. You can imagine my total shock when I had the opportunity to share my idea with a representative from a big book publisher who after hearing my spiel 
looked coldly into my eyes and my soul and said, no one wants to buy a book about death. It took everything in my power not to burst into tears in that moment because he had completely missed the point. The great thing is when someone tells you no, it's not the end. It's actually licensed to do it your way on your terms. After two days of wallowing and thinking about giving up, I realized that I didn't really need him or any publisher to make this dream a reality. So I decided to launch a Kickstarter campaign and crowdfund this project myself. And guess what? He was wrong. People did want the book. People did want to have the hard conversations. And by the end of the campaign, I had raised over $65,000 from 740 people who believed in what this book could be. My vision for the book was driven by my desire to tell the story in 3D. By doing so, I was able to animate their life as well as document their death. I wanted the cover to feel like the needle point my father made for my mother. So it's covered in a textured paper. And I'm wondering if I hold it up to my camera, if you can kind of tell. It's really cool. The end papers are not the fabric covers of one of our oldest family albums. I wanted the viewer to be a voyeur, to be a little uncomfortable, but also curious and go deep into the intimate lives of my parents and experience the journey the way that I was. This is a family scrapbook cut corners and all, <laughs> cut photo corners. Um, every bit of this book was made with intention and purpose, including when to make a photo double page spread. And it wasn't just a book. The story became a traveling exhibition. It was about starting a conversation the story took on a life of its own, and it's become a mission of mine to reframe the conversation around illness and death and to try to help others in the process. While all of this was happening, my husband and I decided that one of the major lessons that we learned in the passing of my parents was that life is in fact short and we needed to make a change and step off a cliff in order to move forward. So we moved 8,000 miles away to the Pacific Island of Guam. Leaving our old life and New York was the smartest decision we ever made. I needed to give myself a chance to heal and reflect and soak in some nice tropical sunshine for a while. Work there was sparse, which was scary but it forced me to slow down, be mindful, and try to find meaning in my life again. And I did. His name is Einstein. He's actually sleeping right next to me right now. Every morning, like clockwork, I would wake up to Einstein's curly tail smacking into me at first light, signaling he was ready to go for his morning walk. Waking up to this bundle of exploding joy got me out of bed almost immediately. We would walk the loop, breathing in the warm island air to the tune of church bells, singing in the breeze. We would greet our neighbors with, or our neighbor's dogs and neighbors with a sniff and a pee uh, before moving on to the next. <laughs> this was our simple routine every day. And I believe that the active meditation of walking Einstein is what brought me back to myself. These walks were my daily practice and they continue to this day. While we lived in Guam, I witnessed a peculiar phenomenon around the tourism culture on the island. 
visitors from Japan and South Korea would regularly, regu uh, regularly visit Guam on vacation to experience authentic American culture. They came for the bright convertibles, the shooting ranges, the one foot tall mega hamburgers and to shop at the Kmart, one of the, one of the world's largest. As a mainlander, which is what we are called out there, I found this particularly surprising since in America, on the mainland, most people don't even think about Guam or the fact that it's a US territory. This was a normal part of my life, so I didn't actually photograph it all that much. But when I got back to the States, I shared the story with some friends of mine, including an editor from National Geographic. And he asked to learn more. Fast forward a few weeks, the project was greenlit and I flew back to Guam to shoot my first story for the iconic magazine. On day two of the assignment, it occurred to me that my period was late. I was scheduled to join a group of young Japanese students whom I met the previous day. So in a hurry, I dug out a pregnancy test, chugged a glass of water, peed on the stick and went over the shot list in my head. The test showed positive. I was pregnant, but just to confirm, I went to the store and I bought four more tests. Yep, definitely pregnant. So just as I had prepared to launch a new era of my career post maternity leave, we realized our son was four months old and wouldn't be portable much longer. So we planned a trip back to Guam. While we were in Guam, 19 hours away by plane, COVID-19 struck the US and our home in Brooklyn became the epicenter. Flying home felt ill-advised. So we flew halfway and hunkered down in Hawaii with our laptops and my camera gear. Once again, life determined what my story would be about. This time, I didn't resist. I just shot and shot. Motherhood has changed me as a person, which means it has also changed me as a photographer. And the truth is, there's no way to create objectively. All of your life experiences will color your work and I think that's a beautiful thing. So my suggestion to you, to all of you, is to be open to what life brings you. Sometimes the big story will be half a world away. Sometimes it will unfold inside your four walls. Photography is about elevating a shared experience, giving into emotions, capturing moments, and adding voice to obscure ideas. It's about watching and being willing to truly see and then sharing it with others in the most honest, straightforward way possible. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, sharing such an emotional story. And uh, I'm always curious after, you know, how many times you've talked about this story and how many times you've, what's it like, do you actually relive it? I mean, the emotions, I mean, how, is it something you can separate yourself from? It's, it's, you've poured your heart. Well, <laughs> so it's interesting. I was thinking about how Deb, you were, when I shared my story with you back at B&H of many years ago, it, it was much more recent in my life. And, and I think, since that time, I've, a, a lot has happened in my life. And, and as time goes on, I, I, I look back on that time. I look back on the story and the experience. And I think I, the, the way that I talk about it always changes because I think maybe as I get older and, and I enter new chapters of my life, I look back and I have a different understanding of kind of what we went through or why we went through it. Um, which is part of the reason why I like sharing the the kind of the whole journey from the project to the book to what happened after because 
this is such a personal story and and I I just I learned so many lessons from my parents beyond photography and so I feel like it's important that I share some I share some of those because I want everyone to you know it's a cliche but we all know that like you know life is short and I just I I miss them desperately but I appreciate the perspective that I now get to spend the rest of my life seeing the world through. Um, and I, and like I said, mother, like motherhood has changed the way that I, I think I, I think about my experience with them. Um, I was, I was, a I, you know, I wasn't a child, but I was, I was the kid and they were the parents and now I'm the parent. Um, so it's just been kind of amazing for me to to try to think back to where it was when I went through it. I getting to share the story though. One thing that's been really special is that it's kept them alive in my mind and my memories are so vivid. Um, and, and this was a really, obviously it was a really difficult time, but it was a really beautiful time. And I saw, you know, the depth of their strength and their courage and their selflessness and their vulnerability that I, I don't know if every kid gets to experience that with their parents and know that they're experiencing it, you know, like if that makes sense. What was the, the initial thing that, I mean, really kind of like when you were experiencing and said, you know what, I have to photograph this or, or is it going to be right to photograph this or how did you kind of, what was the debate you had in your head or was there a debate or were those, was there a process to, of going from, all right, this is a terrible situation and I'm going to, and I'm going to document every moment. And how did the family feel about it? I felt very um, useless during this time. You know, like I, I had no medical knowledge, no medical experience. And I felt like I couldn't help my parents. And all I wanted to do was help them and care for them. You know, like they gave me such, such a wonderful childhood and I'm forever grateful um, and I, I couldn't do anything for them other than like be an advocate for them at the hospital. Um, and I, I toyed with the idea of photographing them, um, but I wasn't really sure. And then I don't think I realized it at the time, but it was, um, I, I mentioned that I, I think it was therapeutic. It, it really was like, I, I look back now and I'm like, how could I have been in those moments with them and not completely fallen apart? And I think it's because like I had my camera and, and any, I feel like any photographer can relate to that feeling of like, yes, you're very present when you have the camera, but it really is this, it's this physical object between you and reality. That's what I would and, ask. And, like, was that more like your shield or was that actually you, the therapy or was that everything? And was it like, you know, do you feel like, you know, I, I can hide behind the camera and kind of deal with this or was it actually making you deal with the situation and looking at it because you couldn't? I think it was both of it. I think it was all of that. And, um, and I can say that looking back, it was all of that. Uh, and to the other part of your question, you know, my parents were used to me having my camera around and um, I had actually photographed my mom when I was a student at ICP years earlier when she was diagnosed with cancer for the second time. Um, and, and actually what happened was after my dad was diagnosed, he asked my mom, do you think Nancy would photograph me? Do you think she would tell my story? I think at the end of his life, he was realizing he didn't want to be forgotten. And, and, and I was, you know, at first I was, you know, I was still processing this reality. Both of my parents, stage four cancer, like, is this really happening? I'm like 28. Like I'd never, you know, I knew they weren't going to live forever, but you kind of think your parents are going to live forever. Um, and, and they were pretty okay with me photographing. Um, my siblings were too. When it came to publishing the work, uh, my brother is a photographer as well. He's a drone, he's a drone pilot or, you know, like a yeah, commercial yeah. drone photographer. Um, and sometimes he would even be like, are you gonna shoot this? <laughs> like if I like was like, so in the moment. Um, my sister uh, is a bit more protective of my parents. And she basically said, if they're okay with this then I'm okay with this. Well, and right. I hope, I, I don't know, I, my, my dream is that this book is this like lasting, this, this little time capsule of memory that 
our future generations, you know, in our family, when they wonder about their grandparents or they wonder about just some of the family stories that I can be like, it's here, I have it, you know? Yeah. Um, how would you suggest someone starting a personal project? Cause I mean, there's so many of us that aren't going through such, you know, turmoil in our families. And so it's like, they were trying to yeah. find that, uh, how does one kind of branch and, and when you started shooting this, it wasn't really too, like I, the end result wasn't, I'm going to be a book and use this, you know, for, you know, you know, my career and stuff like that. So how does one kind of embrace all of that or start something when they don't have that going on? So I have noticed, at least for me, and I, I've heard from others, they feel that many people feel similarly that you almost, when it comes to starting a project, it has to like kind of happen organically. It has to be like driven by your, your, your genuine interest in the topic and the situation. And I think that you just can't overthink it. You just need to go through the motions, start photographing, start asking questions, start researching. And cause like I said, like I thought this project was about their cancer and very quickly I realized it wasn't. Um, and, and I almost think you have to like trust in the process. So if there's something that really interests you, like that dog project, you know, right now it's still at this surface level stage where I just love photographing dogs and humans that love dogs. Um, and I'm hoping that the more I do it, the more kind of the underlying themes will reveal themselves and it'll give the story, the depth that I'm hoping to, hoping to uncover. Um, and I don't know, I think sometimes we look at our own lives and we're like, well, our lives are boring. Like, I don't know if I really want to photograph my own life, yeah, yeah. but I think that that's actually, that means that that kind of project would be, you know, a big challenge. And it's good. I, I, I have found time and time again, that when I challenge myself as much as I don't want to, um, I learn a lot about myself and about my photography and I don't know, trying to see things in a new way, I guess. You found yourself, I mean, I, what other type of projects as a photographer do you do? Do you find yourself when you have such a powerful and, and, and force driven, you know, personal project, do you sort of like, you know, get pigeonholed in the, you know, that type casting of an actor, like, oh, she shoots this. And then suddenly you can't do like, I think doing that dog series shows something completely so different than that. And so light and so wonderful and airy that it was, it was that a conscious thing to go, like, I'm going to do something that is so foreign from that that people see that I can do more or like how do you kind of do, deal with that so I after I photographed my parents and after that was published you know I thought I was going to get pigeonholed and oddly I didn't um the takeaway I think I often heard from editors what and and people was that um it was about family and it was about like um joy and pain and all of these things. And it wasn't about the greediness of the cancer. It was the quiet moments. And so those kinds of things stuck out. I, I do tell people also that the dog project came from a place like, again, you just kind of have to like trust your gut when like, when it feels right, like I'm not a street photographer I've tried. And you will see in my, when I when I do street photography, it's just, it's messy and it's not interesting. And I'm impatient because all I want to do is connect with people up close. So like you can feel it in my photographs. But um, after I finished photographing my parents, I was like, I need to photograph something for the pure joy of it. Like what brings me so much joy? And I was like, dogs bring me joy. And um, I had gotten a, an assignment to photograph the Westminster dog show, the Westminster Kennel Club dog show in New York city. And I went and I was like, oh, I have to find a way. I just, I need, to, I need to do this. Like for my sanity, for my creative muscles, like, and I don't know, like I haven't published that work, but I'm like, and I don't know what will become of it. And I think a big part of it is not expecting anything to become part, you know, like to not think of, I try not to think of the end result, you know, like when I'm starting something and I, I mean, but I also have a bunch of projects that are like, you know, when they're in that beginning stage where I'm like this, I think this is interesting, or maybe this isn't very visual. I do a lot of like stop and go and stop and go and up oh, there's the time. Somebody <laughs> woke up. <laughs> no, he's he's goes to he goes to bed in twelve minutes. Um, my uh, his father is. He's being watched. He's all right. He's not alone in another part of the house. I think, I think he can hear me. Your That's voice, why. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that 
I think we're all right. It's all yeah. good. I hear, I hear little bits. Of... <laughs> when doing a personal project, I mean, obviously that's very time consuming. How do you mix that with, you know, doing other projects and, 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 and making money and, and supporting a project like that? Um, I'm going to talk a little, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just talk a little softer. He's, he's like 20 <laughs> feet away. I think over, I over, over the over, uh, pandemic, we've all gotten used to surprises on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> some of the best parts of the, the Zooms are you know, the, the quick uh, cameos. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, we are talking about family projects. Yeah. Um, this is family. So, go. um, you know, it's, I, I struggle to find that balance. Um, I, uh, I love, I've just accepted that every project that I work on is a long-term project because <laughs> just because like realistically, like I, I want to, I don't want to rush it. I don't want to rush any of the projects. Um, but the reality is, is like, I can't, fly off to these different dog packs every week. I have a child, I have to do work that actually pays money. Um, and so I try to I try to just have multiple streams of income. Um, I think I, I think uh, one thing I've learned during this pandemic in particular has been that um, there are many things kind of aside from photography that bring me joy and purpose and also income, like I love speaking. Um, I do a lot of teaching and mentoring and um, there, I still to this day get messages, it's crazy. I still get like probably once a month, I get like a licensing request, people wanting to republish my photographs from this story for, to, you know, in their, in their Catholic missionary magazine of Switzerland. Okay. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's so, I don't know, it's, it's the randomness of being a freelancer in New York City. And the other thing I'm now trying to do is, I'm really terrified by it all, but I'm trying to start applying to, for grants um, to see if that can help support some of these projects because my life is different now. I can't pick up at a moment's notice and run and cover something. I mean, I could, but that would be bad parenting and probably illegal. Well, it seems like you're, you're, you're a storyteller and, and just from watching you relive and talk about those photos, it, it, you can tell a difference when someone's talking about their photos. You were, you know, it, it was almost like you were narrating a, a book on tape. I mean, I, it, 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 <laughs> everything, it was just wonderful that's, to hear. That's you know. the nicest compliment <laughs> Yeah, ever. I just sat there, it's like, it's like, I, I, even if I wasn't looking at the pictures, I understood the feeling, everything behind it. If I was listening in the car, I'd, I'd be like, ah, oh, I just have to go and look, see these pictures now. It's like, it's, I, there was a connection even without the pictures. So have you always been a storyteller? Are you a writer? Do you play with other mediums like video? Is like, is it just? I think I've, I've always been a storyteller. I've been, I'm not, I, I'm an okay writer, but I've always loved, I mean, I wasn't kidding when I, I joked that when I was a little kid, I was an early, it was an early storyteller. I was a class tattletale. I wanted to know everyone's <laughs> stories and oh. um, I have no boundaries. I you make eye contact with me on the street. I will tell you anything you want to know. Uh, and you know, also when I tell the story of my family, like I just kind of get lost in it because it's, it sends me, uh, you know, down this path of so many different emotions. And um, I really enjoy talking about it. it. It almost is like a reminder for me of the things that we went through. Cause in everyday life, I don't think about all the lessons I learned, you know? Um, but I really enjoy, uh, I don't know. I really, I've always enjoyed storytelling. And so- oh. Yeah, it comes through. It yeah. comes through, and uh, I know Deb is always there and, and has brewing questions. So I'm going to throw yeah. it to Deb for a second because I'm sure she's got a couple. I can I can see it in her eyes. The little <laughs> comes out in ears like I got something. <laughs> I mean, Deb, do you remember? Do you remember? Like, I mean, I guess it's been so many years. You wouldn't. I oh, she's got a different time. She probably does. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> yeah, of course I remember. And it's, this is, um, and it's interesting to see. Uh, how you've grown since the first time I, I had you speak and, and um, yeah, uh, 
And uh, it's just, uh, it's a remarkable story. It was a, remar a remarkable story then, and it is now. And just the growth in your life has made it even that much more remarkable. And, um, and there's a lot of lessons there for other photographers. Um, what, what, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is your book is when you decided to self-publish, which I think everyone should do rather than a commercial publisher, because unless you're some big name photographer, you get nothing by going to a commercial publisher. And now they ex expect you to fund your stuff anyway, even with a commercial yeah. publisher. But um, yeah. uh, how did you decide how many books to publish? Like, okay, what so what I didn't mention in the story, just because I it was too long of a journey, was I was planning on self-publishing but around the time that I was thinking about the book, I won a World Press Award. And um, I started my Kickstarter and it was still going when I went to the award ceremony in Amsterdam. And when I was there, um, it did seem like the perfect opportunity to tell people about this book. And someone, uh, you know, I met a few photographers who were like, oh, you should talk to my publisher, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, okay, I'm not gonna turn down a meeting if it happens, but, um, but what came of that was I met a couple different publishers in Europe, which also was really eye-opening because the European publishers have a different attitude towards photography books and difficult conversations. Like they, they don't shy away. And I ended up meeting a German publisher who I, I thought to myself, you know what, I can do this by myself, but if I want this book to be a success, like I also, I also want to keep working as a photographer. Like I don't want to, I don't know. I, I, I crowdsourced all of my information. And one of the big takeaways I learned was that the thing with the, the one of the challenges of self-publishing is distribution. And so I thought, okay, I did this Kickstarter. Um, I have all this funding. Now I'm not looking for a publisher to necessarily like take me under their wing. I'm looking for a partner um, who I can, negotiate with and use for their resources um, and still make it how I want to make it all these things because I yeah because I knew that I wouldn't need them for their PR because I like as being a freelance photographer you know like no one's going to advocate louder for you or your work than you um, and I knew I could do that and I um, I knew I had a like you know cheering squad back in the US. Um, and so I got the opportunity to meet with one publisher in Germany called um, Hache Kanz. And uh, I remember being like, I'm going to make this bo a book a success. Like, And for me, success, I think that's really important to figure out what success looks like and means to you. And for me, it was, I wanted this book to be accessible and affordable to like a regular person who's not necessarily a photographer. Um, I, Cause I, I felt like it could be a resource for people and I want it to be something that someone can, can read and experience. Um, that's not just my like wonderful echo chamber of photography and photographer friends. Um, and so I went in there with all these, like a checklist basically of all the things that I wanted and was like, He's also experimenting with a toddler bed. So he's like, if he can escape his room easily, which is oh boy. Really <laughs> part of this problem, um, which I think is what's happening right now. Anyway, um, I knew I needed a partner. And I think there's so many, like, I also knew that I was going to be moving to Guam and I couldn't, sh couldn't be schlepping books to Guam and shipping them. Like it was just going to be craziness. So um, I, I kind of, I kind of used the publisher for all the good things that they could offer, um, but was fully planning on doing it myself before I connected with them. So I, I just started, I pulled all of my favorite photography books and I, con <laughs> and I contacted all of the photographers and I asked them all the questions, all the things that they learned, all of the, um, things they wish they knew, um, all the things that they did right. And I tried to just like utilize all that information to, to make this possible. So I ultimately published, they, the, they were actually were like, okay, we'll publish 2000 books, a thousand for you and a thousand for us. And I was like, it's not enough. <laughs> and they were like, who's this crazy American woman? I was like, it's not enough. I have plans. 
Plus I had 650 or 740 backers. You already knew that. 600, 600 of whom were getting a copy. Um, so, uh, so we went back and forth a little bit and I actually, a friend recommended a book agent, which I hadn't even considered. Um, but that was amazing because she negotiated a great deal for me and to make sure I got royalties, which was something photographers don't think about, but when it comes to royalties, yes, they didn't just give me copies. I bought copies of my book using the Kickstarter money. At, I bought them at cost. So it yeah. subsidized the whole printing experience. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted the publisher to stay involved you know, in the next, in over the course of years, I didn't want them to just, you know, it was this season of books and they, you know, move on to their next. I wanted them to continually be thinking about the family imprint, yeah. <laughs> which they were. Um, so I don't know where, sorry, my brain, I got a little distracted. Oh, no, okay. it's fabulous. Uh, so, going back, you know, if you could talk to your younger self or talk to people that are starting to do this, what is, you know, what's the greatest pitfall you tell yourself to avoid and, and the thing that you would say, oh, you have to do this that you learned? People always ask me this and I'm always like, okay, next time I'm going to be prepared <laughs> for an answer. <laughs> um, um, I think, I think the biggest, maybe the biggest takeaway, and this might sound like cheesy or not, is just like, trust your gut and your instincts. Like, like if something doesn't feel right, don't do it. Yeah. Um, and if you feel like this person is like, you can really trust them, then trust them. And like, I don't know. I feel like that's just lessons for life, but like, I've just noticed that like in the process of publishing work and, you know, if you don't, if someone wants to publish your work and you don't feel comfortable with that outlet, um, it's not the end of the world if you say no. Uh, Cause you have Absolutely. to be proud and stand by, yeah. stand by it. Yeah. How do you deal with the times where, you know, you're in such emotional moments where they're, they're very personal moments. And there's a, are there times where you go, I just have to put the camera away. This is not the right time. Or do you fight through that? I was like, well, how do you, how do you deal with that? And I'm like, what, what, did you have specific moments where you actually said, nope, the camera's going down on this one or, you know, or I'm I mean, not showing that picture or, you know. You know, uh, I mean, there was that one moment in the hospital when I put my camera down, I put it down because my dad, I had seen, I had taken so many pictures of them putting an IV in his arm. And I was like, honestly, if I take more, I'll have more to edit. Like that was my thought process. So I put my camera down and then I, fucked, oh, and then I fainted. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, so um, this is not for kids. So <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot of and young then I fainted. Um, I, you know, I didn't always just have it in front of my face. It was always with me. Um, it's more so not to, it's just that like, oh, I'm shouting, shooting too much, but it's, it's just that emotional moment. Like maybe I'm crossing a barrier. Maybe I'm, I, I just, I, did you ever have that moment where like, yeah. this is, this is not right. I have to put the, no, I I'm, I'm overstepping or, or do you just, just go forward and just kind of not have those moments? I, I think I, I tried to read the room. I tried to not overthink it too much and just, move based on how I felt there was that moment that picture I took overhead of my mother's body um and everyone kind of holding on to her and um I hadn't taken a picture in that moment you know we were in that room for hours and my brother turned to me and he's like aren't you gonna shoot this I was like oh like I was so lost in it and so I did and then I and took like two frames and then put it down um I guess I kind of, I, I have, I had a lot of fears of regret. Like, what if I, what if I missed a moment? What if I didn't like, maybe it's important. Maybe I, I need to, I just had this compulsion, especially with this project that I needed to remember. I needed to hold on. Um, but like, I don't know. I feel like there have been moments. I can't think of anything specific right now, but like, I don't know. You just like, trust your gut and what's right and wrong. And thankfully, I don't know, thankfully, like there's also silent shutter. Is it, is it kind of strange to be at a funeral for your own parents and, and taking out a camera? What's the, what's the room or the read of the room? Are they looking at you like, what is she doing? Or is it, are, are you like, how, how present is that camera in that room? How present are you like, you're dealing with your own parents' 
funeral and and are you so are, yeah yeah I just remember so I had my camera over my shoulder and I said to myself I want to take a picture of the audience and the casket um, when I get up there to give my eulogy so actually right before the right before the funeral I went up and I framed it with my camera and I because I was like I don't know if I'm going to have the wherewithal to do this in the moment but I want to remember everybody who was there I need to remember because it just I already knew that I wasn't that nothing made sense like I couldn't believe that my dad died and I couldn't believe that my mom died and um and actually when I walked down the when I walk when the when my sister my brother and I walk in from the back of the temple I just remember the second I saw someone like everyone was staring at us it was very strange. It felt like we were walking down the aisle at a wedding. It was very weird. Everyone was staring at us and everyone was sobbing. And the se second I saw one person, the first person sobbing, I, I fell apart. And I like, I don't know. I was like, I don't know if I'm actually going to take these pictures. Like I, I can't, I, I was tricking myself this whole time. Like if I can shoot it, maybe I can like stay disconnected a little bit, but I'm human. And I didn't know if I was going to do it. And then when I got up on the sand, I, in my eulogy, I pre-wrote something and I was basically like, many of you have noticed the camera on my shoulder. Um, many of you know the story because this, the, this had been, the story had been published before my parents died. So everyone saw it that we knew. And, um, and I just, I, I said something like, it was at my dad's funeral. I remember I was like, I could hear my dad in my head being like, Nance, you got to shoot this moment. Like these are, these people are my story. They're from all parts of my life. They like, they are me. And like, this is the, my big party. Like that's how my dad was. Um, and so I, I think I just, I said, it was strange. I've never felt more. It was, it was a moment when I felt both like terrified and like unbelievably calm because everyone was watching me, but everyone was quiet and no one was rushing me. And I said, you know, if you don't want, you know, like you don't have to look at me, you don't have to smile like you do. If you don't want to be in the picture, you know, turn your head away. Like, I know this is weird, but like, I need, I was like, I need this. And so I did it. And then of course, when my mom died, I was like, I need to do this again. Like I have to, this is... I, I love my parents equally. Um, I've never actually asked. I don't know if I've ever asked anyone how that felt to be on the other side. I probably should. It's definitely interesting. I think the process of that that shot is is, is an important one for other photographers to yeah. hear because uh, it's uh, there's a lot of complexity to it. Yeah, for you know, sure. I, I remember hearing Eddie Adams speak once, and he said that um, he relayed a story uh, of a time when he didn't take a picture, and he said that it's, it's knowing when not to take a picture is, is as important as knowing when to take a picture. But do you feel that because it was your own family, you felt comfortable in maybe going a step further than you would if it was strangers? Yeah, that's probably true. I think because it was my own family, I felt like no one could tell me I couldn't, like I, I needed it, I wanted to do it. And, no, I, and I didn't, frankly, I didn't care what anyone else thought um but you're right I think I might feel I I could feel differently if there's um um like sometimes when people are in a really vulnerable moment, state like if it just doesn't feel right I sometimes also think to myself is this photograph going to matter in the in the larger story you know because sometimes it just if it's not if it's not important to the story that I'm telling I don't want to break the connection I have with that person in that moment. And I need to just be human. I need to just be the, another person right there. Yeah. I can remember the feeling. I just can't remember the situation. Yeah. Can I ask you, um, uh, when you're showing your portfolio to prospective clients, where does your personal work fit in to your portfolio? Or does it? Um, well, it's interesting. A lot of the clients that I, that I have, like that I get over time, um, come across, they find me because they found the project. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, they're kind of curious about the other work that I do. 
And so that's when I show them some of the other stuff that I've done. I've worked for NGOs. I've, you know, I've worked for big corporate clients. I've worked for, um, I did the dog project. <laughs> like, uh, I think what, here's a kind of a funny story. When I was getting married, um, I was looking, I, everyone was like, who's going to photograph your wedding? You know, your photographer. <laughs> uh, and I was, I met with a few photographers and I ended up landing on this, this duo of documentary photographers um, who also shot weddings. And we had a call and they told me a little bit about their, their wedding stuff. And I said, okay, like, I know that you guys, I love your work, your wedding work, but like, do you have any personal projects? <laughs> what kind of stuff do you work on when you're not um, shooting weddings? Like what stuff brings you a lot, you know, joy and creative that, that like creative joy. Um, Cause I wanted to, you know, know them at their core, you know, if, if they, it was important to me that we like found that common ground, um, which was really cool. Cause then I also could then trust that they were going to do a great job because I like respected them as photographer, like I respected them as wedding photographers, but I respected them as like just artists in their own right. If that makes sense. It does. It does. Well, I know you have a toddler that wants to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like he's, it sounds like he's asleep. It sounds like he's in his room. He, it sounds like he got out of his room like five times. Jailbreak. Um, but I think now that I'm speaking softly, well, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. The second I walk by his room, because that's the way I have to go, he's definitely going to wake up again. So, yeah. Did you have any uh, last anyway. questions there, Deb? Um, no, not really. I just um, wanted to say thank you, Nancy, for uh, for uh, speaking. It's, this is really wonderful, and um, this is going to create give a lot of people a lot of great lessons. Um, I'm glad. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to see you such again. A pleasure to have you. And uh, are there any? Uh, wish list personal projects that uh, you have on the in the rafters or, or that you like oh, i haven't got to that but i i have to i mean i'm working on another personal project <laughs> um stemming from my experience with pregnancy and postpartum depression and early motherhood but i can't go into too much detail right now because it's kind no, of it's still funny. figuring its way out um but also i'm diving back into my dog pack project so okay. stay tuned I do have a question yeah. that I ask every one of my guests and everyone that I talk okay. to on the most personal level and, and, and really just what it is to you. What is photography? Personally to you, like. Um, photography is connection. Photography is connection. Photography is I just I'm gonna I'm gonna stand with that one. Photography is connection. <laughs> Period. Boom. Well, thank you. Drop the mic. <laughs> if I you don't know. That might have been silly. Be a photographer, is there something else you would have wanted to do? <laughs> well. Before I became a photographer, for about a year, I was a substitute teacher. I love teaching. Please, you're um, still teaching. I can hear that. Yeah. In yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm still teaching. Yep. I actually am doing, I do like mentor, I do Sony sessions. Um, uh, but um, I love teaching and I love teaching like, especially like K through five. That's always been, I've always really enjoyed that. Uh, but it was so exhausting. I don't know if I, if I have the stamina, um, especially as a substitute teacher. Oh my gosh. They see you. How huh? much does the equipment come into to play? Are you someone that's just like, uh, I'm shooting or how much do you like to, because I know what, you know, kind of equipment you work with uh, and I'm sure everyone's always curious what people are shooting on yeah. and how much does that come into play with what you're doing and your, your choices and how much has it affected your work that, that you know, I mean, frankly, all I really want is like a good camera that I can, that I can use without thinking too much, <laughs> you know, cause I just want to be, I'm not super technical. Yeah. Like I just want to be like ready. Um, I did fall in love with the, the a nine two, um, because it's like more of a sports camera, you know, like it's really great for capture, like capturing motion and movement and between my dog project and my son, 
like I need a fast camera. <laughs> um so i love that i also have the a1 now which i'm like a huge fan uh and generally i just use my 35 it's my favorite lens i just picked up that i i, I was one of the I, like, I had the 35 zeiss that came out and then i just finally said all right no i'm gonna go to the 35 gm and boy i gotta tell you the 51 two changed my life <laughs> really I, I've never been a 50 shooter. I've never really liked the 50 range. I've yeah. just never been something for me, but the 51 too, I like, I hardly take it off my camera anymore. It's that it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, I, I'm in love with that lens. That's so interesting to hear that because, yeah. because I always shoot with the 35 when I want something tighter, I have the 85. Yeah. And because I have the 85, I'm like, why would I have the 50 if I have the 35 and the 85? But I, that 50. 50. Interesting. You, don't, you never think that 0.4 to 0.2 is going to make it all, <laughs> it's so fast and sharp. I want to thank you so much. We could talk you know, all this for ages and ages, and hopefully we'll have you back to talk about more you know, inspiration and stuff like that. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. I want to you know, say it was such a pleasure to talk with you, Deb. Thanks for bringing this to Same. us. Today. And uh, any last, last parting words? Where do people follow up in, on all your stuff? Where do they find you? Where do they find your work? Where can they follow up and learn more about you? Um, they can check me out on my website, nancyborg.com. Um, and yeah, and then, and through Sony, I do those, I do these, like, if you want to, you want to meet with me for an hour, talk, talk projects, like all, that's all I like to do. And they can I like, find that on the Sony Alpha University site. Yep, absolutely. And on my, and on my website, but go to Sony Alpha Universe and, yep. um, it like, honestly, like I like to talk about other people's work. Cause it like then makes me feel better about not working on my own projects. So what's it like um, if you can actually contact you directly to get kind of one-on-ones with you? How's that experience been? Because I mean, that's pretty unique that Sony's doing that and having that access to, you know, it's artisans and, and you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Oh yeah. It's been awesome. I mean, it's been awesome for me because I've met so many like really interesting people with different stories at different stages. And they, I just, when you're not, in school and you don't have that community who's going to critique your work and, you know, like, and really give you the time and the energy um, and the bandwidth. Um, it's hard to find that outside of school. So what I, I like, it, I like that about the Sony sessions. I mean, I've been looking into maybe like signing up to do one with another artisan because like, I don't know, I appreciate everyone's time and, and I just want to keep growing. I think like, I want to keep growing and educating myself. Yeah. Um, as a photographer and as a storyteller and all of that. So I encourage people to do it um, because at least on my end, it's been really fun. So. Well, thank you again. Much love. And uh, until next yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Everyone. Take care.